Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend Stephen Taylor of Stephen's Drum Shed. Stephen, how are you? I'm great, man. I'm really excited to be here. Really awesome. excited. To, I'm yeah. really excited to geek out about this. Actually. I am too. I am too. We uh, <laughs> we recently met and hung out at uh, PASIC with you and uh, Tim Buell, and we got dinner and everything, and... Uh, yeah, I must, and I still, I, I apologize to you there. That was like after a day of like nine hours of filming content, <laughs> I was completely <laughs> shot. I was like the world's worst hang. I just no, sat you were there. great. You were great. Tim and I just talked about Pro Tools the whole time and geeked out on audio. But uh, yeah. you know, we got some onion rings and and had some beers. It was it was great, man. It was great. Yeah. So, so yeah, today um, you're here though to talk about the history of learning and practicing the drum set because you yes. are a guy who is like very, very well spoken and, and well learned when it comes to uh, teaching the right way to practice. Correct. Cool. So um, I think we should just, per usual with uh, this podcast, just go back to the beginning of practice because it's kind of like a, um, I mean, honestly, it's something I never would have thought about. Like you, you it's hard to, to, to really think about people practicing that long ago. Um, my guess is it's kind of military stuff, but I'm excited to hear what, uh, what you came up with. Yeah. So, you know, and one of the reasons why this, you know, uh, this whole topic excited me years ago, I've got a whole chorus on this. It's like 20 hours long. Uh, I can be as nerdy as you want on practice in the drum set. Um, but I found that, um, most of my teaching nowadays is done online uh, through my membership program. And, and what I was finding was I was having a lot of people hit walls and not move. And the problem was not that they weren't motivated. The problem wasn't that they didn't have the time. Um, the problem was that they didn't have access to the materials. The problem was they didn't have a game plan or they didn't understand how to go through a practice session and learn this instrument, you know. Yeah. And so that really sent me on, you know, a chase for a while, uh, reading and studying on the brain and on practice and historically how it's done and how it's done in other fields. And, um, so yes, I've become, uh, you know, that's become one of my passions is actually, you know, practice and how do we learn this thing? So, and it's definitely changed, you know, I'm glad we're doing this cause it's changed over the past hundred or so years with all the, the technological age that we've gone through. Um, there's been so many advances so quick and it's all happened right at the inception of the drum set. If you really think about that, the drum set really started to come together in a concrete fashion in the 1920s in the vaudeville area. Before then, you had some, some uh, players that were making like their own homemade you know, uh, uh, pedals so that they could play this in the pit while the, the show was going on or whatever. But there was no one that had was mass producing these things and the drum set wasn't set up in any organized sort of a way. And we've got Gene Krupa to thank about that. And, you know, and, and, and so, right around the time that sound recording really started to become popular was when the drum set was born. And so not only do we have an instrument that was made uh, for improvisation, it's really the only instrument I can think of that was made strictly from an improvisational standpoint. You know, before that snare drumming, uh, pit drumming, it was all very notated. Uh, and you've got, you know, Baby Dodds is one of the first drummers that was, that was recorded improvising. Um, it's a, it's kind of a, to us, it's not a revolutionary thing, but back then they're like, wait, he's not, he's not playing the page. Hold on. You know? Yeah. So that, that changes how you practice. That changes how you approach that. And it's a new instrument. Our instrument is very new. You know, the drums are not new. The drums are the oldest instrument, right? But as far as the drum set, it's one of the newer instruments on the scene. So, um, and how we approach it, how we learn it, how we practice it has changed with technology and, and with all those advancements. So. Yeah, I would imagine that like, uh, but at the beginning there, let's say in the 1920s, there had to be some crossover of guys who would be coming up in more um, like rudimental practicing, yeah. you know, doing that stuff, then saying, okay, well, now I have a drum set. Now I need to change a little bit of how I'm doing it. Yeah. So everything that I, you know, pull up and read about um, is, um, is all about, um, you know, up until that time, you know, we had some texts that were standardized for drumming. Um, we had the rudiments, those types of things. They had organized this stuff because marching and, and playing in a, in a concert setting, that type of a thing. 
it was very popular, you know, in, in the classical world. Um, so really with the early days, whenever, you know, jazz started coming around, whenever you have guys like Baby Dodds assimilating a drum set, whenever you've got him, you know, innovating with this, you know, uh, the, the shimmy beat that he would play and elongating these press rolls. And that's way different than the, than the, than the typical doom, tzz, doom, tzz. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's putting more, he's putting more sauce on it. He's, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden you have drummers Whenever he's out on the road or, you know, obviously the the uh, boats on the Mississippi and other travel ways, that's why you see cities like Chicago, St. Louis, um, you know, uh, New Orleans, all these port cities. That's the reason why they became known as music meccas, because these guys were traveling these steamboats up and down, you know. And so you have guys coming to see Baby Dodds play to try to figure out what he's doing. Because remember, there's there's no real recording at that time. Yeah. You can't get a recording. You can't get a book of like, oh, this new instrument, the drum set, they just put on a method book on it. Let me go grab that and then learn it. You know, that wasn't happening. And then Baby Dodds knows he's got something special, right? And he knows guys can't play it. So they're coming to check him out to find out what he's doing. And they're going back home and they're trying to practice that. So really, from a historical standpoint, that's really how music has been taught over the years it's been taught as a as a as a language you you one person to another showing the other person as an, as an art that's why uh you have uh, the apprentice system was such was such a successful system for teaching someone whether that be art or teaching them carpentry or whatever that is and we have a lot of examples of an apprentice type system that i can point to um well let's say we can point to chick webb who was the first big band drum you know, really leader at that time and had tuberculosis of the spine. So he was a hunchback, really short guy, uh, but mentored a lot of people. And, and actually, Art Blakey was, I believe, his valet. I believe he was his driver. Wow. And so you have guys like Art Blakey pointing back to Chick Webb and the time that Chick Webb put into him. That's a mentorship. This is an apprenticeship type of a program. He doesn't have a formulaic thing of where they're sitting down doing lesson one, lesson two. What he's doing is he's showing him how to do it as he's doing, he, he's leading by example. And then you have someone like Art Blakey go on who runs the Jazz Messengers for 35 years and it's known as an incubator for all types of talent. Uh, he's known as a mentor for drummers everywhere and for 35 years he's running guys through his band and mentoring them the same way that Chick Webb mentored him. We also have an example of an apprenticeship type of a deal whenever it comes to, as far as learning this drum set, whenever it comes to someone like Tony Williams with Alan Dawson. Alan Dawson, you know, everybody goes, it's, it's amazing that, you know, Tony Williams is playing with Miles Davis at age 19. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but you had Tony says one of the best drummers in the world, Alan Dawson, who later taught at Berkeley and is, is known for his contribution to to teaching and learning the instrument and formalizing our our language. Um, he was picking Tony up at ages eight and nine going like 60, 90 miles one way out of the way from the gig, picking Tony up, taking him to the gig with him, letting him set up, letting him sit in, let him in listening, and then getting him back home safely. Wow. You have somebody doing this for, out, for, for Tony at age nine. Hmm. Um, this is a very good example of an apprenticeship model. Um, and so if, you, you know, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you have any seasoned musician, whether that be a drummer, uh, for me it was a keyboard player coming up uh, that was my... Um, a mentor today, he's still a second father to me. I would, you know, if he called right now, I'd drop everything. I'd sell the car and I'd go do whatever he needed me to do to help him out. That's how much he helped me in my life. So it doesn't matter what kind of a musician they are. If they're willing to give you that kind of time and mentor you in that way. Um, Ellis Marsalis in New Orleans has been known for doing that with, with all types of musicians. And he's a piano player. You should take advantage of that because some of the best players come from that mentorship system. Um, Stanton Moore in New Orleans, uh, Johnny Vidakovich. Actually, he taught Brian Blade. Uh, Stanton Moore came up under uh, Vidakovich's tutelage. And some people don't get Vidakovich. He's, he's a free spirit man, to say the least. But you have him taking the time and letting these guys bring drums in for him. Let him then go to the gig with him. Like That's a mentorship type of thing. That's an apprenticeship thing. That's a very common way for a music, uh, musical instrument or any type of skill to have been taught. Yeah. Uh, really up until modern days. In colleges now, that's why you have grad students. Um, grad students, that's an apprenticeship model. It's a very old model for teaching anything. So we've, we've assimilated that into this. I'm lucky because uh, not even on a drumming standpoint, but as an audio engineer, I had a mentor. I have a mentor. I'm lucky enough to work with him now. Uh, his name is Adam Plyman, who I, I interned here where I work and then years later got a job. And the amount you can learn from a mentor, and it's just, you know, 
if anyone's listening to this and you kind of know someone, just you're not bugging them. Really having a mentor is one of the best things that you can possibly do. And, you know, as a teacher, if you have a student or you have someone that comes and says, look, I just want to, you know, be around, hang around, help. I want to learn from you. I don't want to be in the way. You're going to pour into that person so much more. If I get gigs come through, I'm passing of that person yes. because they work with me. I know that they're trustworthy. Yeah. So that's why you see players like a Tony Williams at age 19 coming and kicking butt on the scene with Miles Davis because he's had guys like that in his life. So um, at the early inception of this instrument, we also, you got to keep in mind as we talk through this really four different things. We have advancement in the instrument and its development. Okay. We have the acceptance of the instrument as a valid instrument, and that in some ways is still not being accepted on the collegiate level. If you go to college, you can major in percussion. That's your instrument. Uh, not a ton of universities and colleges will allow you to major as, as your instrument as drum set. I know I was not allowed. I was a percussion major, but with a jazz studies you know, emphasis. And uh, you, know, you don't have a violin player coming in you know, having to major in strings. You know, it, it's so it's it's taken years for them to accept that as a as an instrument. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, advancement in technology has been huge as far as learning the drum set and how we practice. And then advancements in the knowledge of the brain within the past 15 or 20 years has been massive. Uh, so, yeah, in the 1920s, you have just really the drum set kind of coming together. You have that apprenticeship model. We really don't have any collective body of drum set resources because it's a new instrument. And so it's really passed on person to person, right? Yeah, yeah. So then right about that time, we also have sound recording coming around. The reason that early recordings of, of Gene Krupa, Baby Dodds, uh, early recordings of Chick Webb don't sound great is because the microphones at the time could not, they couldn't handle the dynamic nature of the drum set. It was yeah. just too much. The lows and the crazy highs from the cymbals and all of that. Uh, so you don't have really great recorded examples from those early times. Uh, but you do have, you know, online there's an example of Baby Dodds showing his shimmy beat and explaining how people couldn't do it. So this was how he transferred that knowledge. Um, and then coming on up, we have sound recording. So then guys start listening. They're like, okay, cool. That's like, you know, if you're thinking... I don't have a band to play with. I'm just sitting here practicing this thing. And then all of a sudden you have something that has speakers and you are able to have a band in your room. Even if you, you know, you got to play low so you can hear them. That's a huge game changer in your practice time. I don't think people really realize that. They went from not being able to play with people to being able to put on an album and play with the top of the tops. This is a massive development. It's comparable to like the YouTube generation now to be able to sit and see these guys, to be able to watch videos of you teaching a mm -hmm. lesson versus just reading a book is yeah. massive. It's huge. And so then we have the learning pass through to they're sitting there learning from the music as well as going and seeing it live. And that's a big game changer, you know, and then we kind of move forward and the drum set is getting old enough that now we have, you know, people writing books for it. And we have guys repurposing older texts like Syncopation for the Modern Drummer, uh, George Lawrence's Stick Control. You have guys like Alan Dawson coming along and going, hey, wait a second, we can use this on the drum set. We can use the rudiments on the drum set. Let's take this and apply all this. So they're kind of just trying to formalize what's happening. You have guys like Jim Shapin. Um, I've actually had a student send me one of the, I don't have it sitting here, one of the kindest things. I've, it was just a gift and it, and it arrived. I had no clue. It sat at the post office for a couple months. They didn't call me and let me know it was there. Whenever I finally figured out, I was like, oh, I got a package. So I go up there and a, an online student of mine had sent me an old LP, an old vinyl of Jim Shapin. He made one of the first play along series. It was made as a promotional tool for, I, I forget the name of the drum company or the drum store, but in the inside, it's got, you know, pick up the drums, the hottest <laughs> new instrument, like all these really old school ads. That's it's got awesome. pictures of all these, you know, small music conventions with the Joe Morellos and, yeah. and those kind of cats in the pictures, uh, Buddy Rich and all those guys. It's got, you know, old advertisements, but inside of it, it's got with the drums or without the drums. So you can play it either way. As well, it's got charts inside of there. Hmm. So you, it's got lead charts, but it also has drum charts. So uh, a transcription of basically what he was playing. Um, that's huge. Yeah, that's ahead of its time. Oh, big time, big time. So now we're going from, okay, now I can play along with this to, oh man, somebody made a drumless track for me to play mm. with. This is a huge change whenever it comes to your practice time and, and how you go through that, how you go about learning the instrument, because now you have, you, you know, you have a method for the mat and now you can, you can practice to that music. One thing I've heard you talk a lot about, uh, which I really like is 
focused practice time uh, mm-hmm. instead of just sitting down and messing around and just playing, which is great, mm-hmm. which you need to do from time to time, but actually focusing and, and, and doing something important. And that kind of, those books and that early play along gives you something to do. I mean, you can't really just yeah. pull it off the top of your head. You need some guidance. It's like a, that's a remote it really teacher. Does, it gives you structure to your practice time. Now, you know, oh, I'm trying to practice this beat that, you know, Baby Dodds was doing or whatever that may be. I know I'm, I'm bringing him up a lot. He's, he's on my mind. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you have this recording. Oh, cool. Now I can learn this whole set. And then you, you take the time to break down. Wait, what was that thing he was doing in measure three? Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Let me see if I can work that out. Um, so that's kind of the evolution, you know, up from 1920s. You got person to person. You got the music to the person. Then you have a book to person which is a big deal. And then you start having some of the classic texts start coming out. Gosh, you can have Gary Chester's New Breed. You can have Shapey's Pattern Series. You can have Alan Dawson starts teaching his uh, system for going through syncopation and organizing the language of jazz drumming, uh, Future Sounds by Garibaldi. All of these become landmark uh, Was it funk studies by Rick, is it Rick Latham? Um, all these become landmark books in the collection of learning the drums and they become standardized on the collegiate level. Um, now, as well, around the 40s and 50s time, you have um, Max Roach coming along. And a lot of people don't associate him with teaching. Max Roach was one of the first jazz musicians to teach at a full time at a collegiate level. A lot of really? people don't know that. Yeah. No. And, um, and I forget where it was. So you have him coming around around that time. So not only do we now have this new instrument that we're like, okay, we're getting some resources for. Now it's becoming accepted enough that on the college level, they're going, hey, we need to get a teacher for this because this is a deal. Like apparently this is gonna be a thing. And that's whenever you start seeing uh, some of the jazz guys come in teaching full time, like Max, or you see an Alan Dawson going over at Berkeley. Uh, you see an Ed Sof going to um, uh, UNT. Uh, so it's the drums is still not considered an instrument to major in, but it's a big enough deal that they're like, we got to get somebody here that can teach this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have Alan, you know, and Alan Dawson coming along, and he's putting out players like Vinnie Caliuta, Terry Lynn Carrington, Tony Williams, uh, John Robinson, like. I mean, just to have those four on your roster, holy cow, you know, that's massive. Whatever the guy's doing, he's doing something right. Yeah. So you have a lot of these guys, you know, Gary Chester's another one. He was a seasoned session musician, touring guy, and he, and he devotes the, the later part of his life to teaching. So you have these guys really trying to give back um, and really trying to formulate a way for us to learn and, and practice this, you know, instrument. Yeah, and it, it um, I'm going to do an episode on it. I don't know a ton about him, but I know just of him as a teacher of Roy Knapp, who was major teacher of, uh, I know it's Gene Krupa, Louis Belson, mm-hmm. Baby Dodds. Um, he had the, the Roy C. Knapp Drum School, which really? I've, I've had um, Rob Cook of the Chicago Drum Show and an author of mm-hmm. a ton of books reach out and say, we should do an episode on him, um, which I want to do. Yeah, and you've got another example there of someone putting out so many great students, but it's a real person-to-person type of a teaching thing. Exactly. You know? exactly. Um, and they obviously have a curriculum that they do, but it's not codified. It's not put into a book. It's not mass-produced. I mean, w- when we became, when we had the ability to make a plastic widget that contained music, that's whenever things changed on so many levels. Yeah, and but it's the uh, like I remember hearing on another podcast, um, Brendan Buckley, the great drummer um, who we saw at PASIC. I heard him talking about getting taught by uh, Sonny Igo, Tommy Igo's dad, and mm-hmm. it would be a thing where he would drive forty five minutes and he would get there and you'd learn. And it's I don't know. Uh, this might sound bad, but I guess there's more. Um, and I've never taken a lot of online drum lessons via Skype or anything like that, but. When you have, I remember growing up taking drum lessons. If you miss the lesson, you're kind of like, wow, I'm going to get yelled at next week. Like yeah. He's gonna be like, Why did you miss? There's more, uh, I can't, what's the word I'm looking for? There's more like, um, uh, that you're held more accountable. Yeah, it's more accountability. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that was me coming up. The internet, that's the way, whenever you say like the internet wasn't a thing, you sound like this ancient guy. I'm only 38. I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. But the internet was not a deal until I was in high school, man. Yeah. Yep. Um, I remember sitting at dial up and being like, what in the world is happening right yeah. now? Why is it making this noise, you know? Um, so the internet came around. I, I had to drive 30, 35 minutes one way. I took from uh, Henrique de Almeida. He was uh, doing his graduate studies at USM under do- Dr. John Wooten. Uh, Henrique had actually taken from Alan Dawson, and Henrique uh, actually now teaches up at Berkeley College of Music. So I love to look back at the lineage of my drum teachers yeah. and see, you know, recently you're talking about online. I recently 
uh, did a couple lessons with Klaus Hessler. I'm a teacher, but I'm, I'm a student too. Klaus took from Jim Chapin. Jim Chapin took from Moeller. So you have this lineage of teachers uh, up through the years. Yeah. So, you know, after that sound recording, uh, you know, you then start to have this video. And video was a new deal. And then you have these guys coming along, uh, Jim Shapin and several others that are like, hey, let's jump on this. Let's get instructionals made. So you have the VHS and the DVD. And that was really kind of came at the tail end of VHS. I was more of a, of a of DVD, but that was a huge deal. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now I can see Steve Smith break apart whatever he does. You know, now I can see, you know, Carter Beaufort or whoever it may be. Um, that's a that's a big change. You you don't have video and then you do have video. Yeah. Um, even just the ability to see those drummers on TV and you don't have to go see them live anymore. This is a big deal, you know, as far as how we're developing, what you practice in your practice room, those types of things. And a lot of session players during that time, uh, well, I had Scott Williamson here. He's a Nashville heavyweight. He came in to talk to my uh, students not too long ago. And um, that's, you know, he said I was a horrible drum student because I was busy trying to learn from the recordings. He said mm. I would spend the whole week learning recordings. And so you have you know, a formalized method and an unformalized method uh, kind of working together to produce some, you know, fantastic players. Yeah, man, um, this makes me think, this is going to sound crazy, bear with me here. So last night I watched on Netflix, there was a movie about like the history of like Kung Fu and mm -hmm. how it progressed. And the, a big thing they talked about was the advent of VHS and when people could bring the tapes home and then mm -hmm. people, it said a bunch of like young martial artists would sit there and watch it like in slow mo and rewind to learn exactly the moves they were doing, which yeah. is one hundred percent parallel to watching a drum tape. And you can actually now see what they're doing versus seeing it live, seeing it yeah. one time in the theater. You it's, can slow it down. Exactly. I mean, my drum lessons, I still remember um, taping them. He said, if you bring a tape, I'll tape it for you. He had a cassette recorder. Yeah. And so Henrique would put that tape in. I still have some of those tapes in a box somewhere. And that's how I remember, would remember the lesson. I would go back totally. and go, oh, wait, what was that? Oh, okay. I remember, you, you know, then I go back to the Shafee book or whatever we were working through and I, you know, do it after I listen to him play it. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a big advancement. We have a completely new instrument. And along with that instrument, I don't know of any other instrument like this, along with that instrument, the development of sound recording, the development of, uh, of a worldwide publishing uh, network, uh, the development of video, the development of the internet, which is kind of where we're kind of coming up to. Mm -hmm. And um, and don't worry, there's lots more we can talk about with all this. Uh, this is just this is just the technological changes, you know. Absolutely. Um, and so you have the the internet coming along, and there's a big difference. So Tim works with me. You know Tim Buell. Yeah. Um, he works with me, and he came up just a couple of years after me. Uh, I don't believe it's even ten years after me. I mean, seven or eight years. But Drummer World was available for him. Yes. Drummer World wasn't available for me five six years before that. So I came up not knowing anything about Drummer World. Tim came up living on Drummer World, right? Watching the videos, doing the transcript, like digging into that. I knew nothing about that till past college. And it was a thing, I just, it was not part of my learning experience. So when he and I talk about a learning experience and how we learn those types of things, Drummer World doesn't even play into my learning experience. What does is written, you know, those classic texts, Shapey and Chester and, uh, you know, Future Sounds and all that, as well as something like Modern Drummer, where I just consumed these magazines. I, you know, in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, you have these magazines starting to come out uh, that are fantastic because they're giving us a view of these drummers on the road, what their exercises are, all of this stuff. But it really is just a time of trying to assimilate what's going on, how can we make this a language. And that's why teachers like an Alan Dawson, a Jim Shapin, a, a Gary Chester. That's why they were so revolutionary, Gary Shapey, because they put these things into systems, you know, and you mm -hmm. learn the Alan Dawson rudimental ritual. You learn Alan Dawson's method for going through syncopation and all the different ways so that you can learn to comp within jazz. Yeah. Before that, there was no method for learning the vocabulary of jazz. Uh, he developed that method. And so lots of advancements within that time. And I think also, uh, all of this, just you saying like modern drummer, it just, it makes you not be on an island learning an instrument. It mm -hmm. makes it so we're all together and you can go like, oh man, my setup is similar to his setup and oh, I could yep. move my ride over here and he's got one Tom instead of two. It's like yep. the world is getting I, smaller. I was outside of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, closer to a place called Sumrall, Mississippi. And 
I felt isolated. You know, I remember getting in the mail these zines from like, you know, these small record companies with all like the new releases and I would order them by mail and get this new band or a new compilation that had like 10 different bands and I'd be like oh that band I gotta listen to them yeah you know um so it really did it started bringing things in and made me as a young kid not feel like okay I'm you know I was in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi but I love punk rock you know I was I was connected with all these drummers like you know it, it wasn't the internet but it definitely sure. wasn't far away from it yeah. and so and then you've got you know the advent of the internet but then we have the advent of social media uh, and once social media came around, that really took the middleman down because I can actually get on to, you know, Peter Erskine's Instagram page if he has one. I don't know if he yeah, has one. Yeah, he does. And I don't just listen to, um, I don't just listen to him play. I don't just watch a clinic. I don't just, you know, see a performance or listen to an album. I actually now can hear from Peter every day. And if he has a thought that's worth something and puts it there, I can be like, man, I wondered how he did that, or I wondered what he thought about that, or it's amazing to me that that middleman is gone, and we have such access, and for those that are kind enough to uh, kind of let people into that and mentor them through that, I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, yeah. tool. It, it humanizes them. Yeah, it definitely does. You know, imagine if, if uh, you know, Gene Krupa, we've mentioned him, imagine if he would have had an Instagram profile where you could get on and hear from Gene at his gig. I mean, it's it's unfathomable, right? Imagine yeah. if Tony Williams would have had a had a, a a phone he could carry and be like, "Hey, playing here tonight." I'd be like, "What is happening?" You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's it's really exciting to see all of the all of the technological changes, the changes within our instrument, them becoming more accepting of it on a collegiate level. Now, what this also has done to us is we have obviously advances in the instrument. We have advances uh, in, uh, in the technology, uh, but there's also advancements in the knowledge of, the, of how the brain works and how we learn. And so one of the things back in the day, uh, well, even up till recently, was they assumed that you were born with sets of skills you know, uh, that was a natural talent. You know, you, you, he's naturally talented or at so-and-so. Talent wasn't seen as something that is a skill acquisition. Talent wasn't seen as something that, oh no, that person had early exposure to that, you know, thing. These are new concepts within the last 15 or 20 years and understanding of all the white matter in the brain. They, they used to think that was just like padding or something for the brain. Oh, term, come to find out it's myelin and that's actually how we learn. Like that stuff's super important. Um, and so once they start really understanding how the brain learns, it really breaks down the barrier of you can, you can learn anything that anyone else can and we have scientific studies to prove it. You know, the reason Tony Williams was so great at such an early age was because he had an Alan Dawson. He had early exposure. He had an early mentor. The reason Buddy Rich was so great, uh, and I'm going to, you know, anytime you talk about Buddy, you get people that are going to start throwing stones, but <laughs> he was born into a vaudeville family. Yeah, Both exactly. of his parents. By age two, he was on the stage performing. At some, at one point, he was, I believe, one of the highest paid child actors of that time. Yes, I believe years. Jackie Cooper was maybe more... Yep more highly paid but uh and i know that just because i posted a jackie cooper video and someone said that so. <laughs> <laughs> somebody informed you yeah. instagram and so but. to me i'm thinking if he wouldn't have been good i'd have been pretty disappointed like you're set up to hit a home run there yeah um this is like someone you know saying uh you know uh your your two-year-old is good at using a spoon well of course she's good at using a spoon she said two parents three or four times a day they're like no you don't pour it down your pants you put it in your mouth you know no don't you know your brother doesn't want any he's got his food you put it in your mouth like yeah. for two years we've just been ingraining how to use a spoon the early exposure to a spoon means she can if you think about eating that's a fantastic thing to be able to take these utensils and get the food on there like that's a big talent for a kid yeah uh, it's the same way with drumming you know and so the same way we would never say oh that person's just naturally talented at driving, oh, that person's just naturally talented at eating food. A person is not naturally talented at a musical instrument. Now, there are people who are, they excel faster. They may, so this is where, this is where the studies really show, and it's hard to, it's hard to measure this, is the interest of a child in a subject. Mm -hmm. So whereas I may expose one of my sons to music at a very early age, they may have zero interest in it. They may be very interested in building Legos and taking things apart. So a very mechanical type of a thing. 
Whereas I have friends and you have early composers who from the time they can hear, they're just interested in those sounds. How can they recreate those sounds? Uh, I have a nephew, he's interested in acting. He's interested in writing. I don't, he's interested in drawing. I don't have to beg him to do it. He just comes and he's like, Hey, I wrote this play. He thinks that's play for him. Mm -hmm. Writing a stage play is his idea of having a good time playing. So you, what you can't measure is a child's interest in a subject and how far they'll go. So Buddy Rich wouldn't have been Buddy Rich if he wouldn't have latched onto the drums and been so interested in it. Yeah. Same thing with Tony Williams. He wouldn't have been Tony Williams if he wouldn't have latched onto it and had that natural, um, curiosity about the instrument. So I'll agree, some people are uh, wired to like different things, but none of us are talented. It's an incredible waste of natural ability for you know nature to say, oh, this person's gonna be incredibly talented at being a blacksmith. What happens if you're a computer programmer and nature, you know, you're born in the 1600s, but your you're disposition to be a computer programmer? Well, it's a, it's a huge waste of resources yeah. on <laughs> Mother Nature's part, you know what I'm saying? What yeah. makes a lot more sense is that we have the, the meat computers within our heads that can actually take the information and we can become great at whatever we have an interest in and whatever we put that focused practice time into. So really the last 15 to 20 years has, and I've, I've had many conversations with people debunking this old historical thinking of you're born naturally talented at something. You're just not, you're just not. No, the exposure is so important though. Cause I think to myself, Huge. Like, like I've never skied. I don't mm -hmm. live anywhere in a, near a place where I can ski. And I'm like, I think about that sometimes where I'm like, maybe I'd be good at it. Or like surfing. It's like, mm -hmm. that seems fun. I've never really done it because I don't live, yeah. I live in Cincinnati. It's like, yeah. I can't surf on the Ohio River. But, but um, exactly. If you'd have been exposed to it at an early age and you know, all of this gets into people are real big at putting labels on people. So we have something like uh, the spectrum, which would be autism. So yep. you, on the spectrum, you have a very functional end where that person just becomes obsessed with things like they're totally normal. But if he gets obsessed with this thing, you should just get out of his way. So we're running the length, the ranks of like a Steve jobs mm -hmm. who becomes just incredibly obsessed with an idea. Uh, I had people like that coming up in school. Now they would label them as on the spectrum. To me, they were just predispositioned to focus in on a certain thing. Uh, and so uh, my, my wife used to work with autistic children and uh, she had one that was incredibly interested in albums and who played on the albums. So he could tell you the album, the name of the album, the band, the year it was released, where they recorded it, the players on it, what song, everything about the album. He knew cool. everything. He was intensely interested in albums. Um, so yeah, that's something that you can't measure is a child's interest in a certain um, in a certain thing as well. One of the things that they can't account for these days is, um, your physical disposition. So if you're born, you know, six foot 11, you're naturally going to be better at basketball than somebody that's four foot, you know, four foot nine. Yeah. Um, you're naturally going to come into that game stronger than anybody else because that game is built around height. Uh, height is a huge correlate to success in something like basketball. And so a uh, physical characteristics are something that um, they can't measure either. That's one thing that is a telltale on um, when it comes to mainly physical things. Yeah, like ambidextrous, being ambidextrous with the drums. Mm -hmm. I guess that could be seen as a sure. benefit. Um, sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, you have the old thinking back in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. They did not understand how the brain worked. They did not understand, uh, you know, all of those things. Now that we understand it, it makes the practice time a much better experience because I can prove to you about, you know, how we learn and why we learn. Um, and that really comes down to advancements in the brain, you know, and we can, you know, let's talk about myelin. Yep. Myelin is the, you know, the, the white matter in the brain. Uh, and, and before they didn't really understand the way we can image brains. Now we can really see what's going on and what's firing and what's not. Originally, they just thought that was uh, padding in the brain or they really know what it did. It was there, but maybe it's not important or maybe it is important or, you know, the same thing they didn't understand what the prefrontal cortex did. That has all of our administrative capabilities, our uh, focus, our task management, all of those things come from the prefrontal cortex. Well, they used to do partial lobotomies through the eye and they would blight out Man. part of the prefrontal cortex. And then they started wondering, why do these people act like animals? They can't clean their house. They can't, you know, organize tasks. They seem, you know, they don't clean, like they lost their humanity, their ability to, because they were blighting out the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, they you stuck know. something in their eye into their brain. That's why they can't yeah, do it. <laughs> it's exactly, you know, they don't understand why that, 
how it worked. Now we do. Yeah. And so um, with myelin, there's some great books on this. If, if anybody listening is interested in, in reading about a little bit about the brain, about practice and about how this works, uh, some, some good ones are The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Uh, Practice Perfect would be another great one. The Distracted Mind has another one that's uh, some great studies on the brain, as well as the leading study that they did. It's the, the role of deliberate practice in the acquisition of expert performance. You can download that one for free. It's a professional study. It's about 40 pages long. Uh, that's where the 10,000 hour rule came from, all of those. Um, and so what they found out about myelin is um, it actually helps in skill acquisition. So skill acquisition uh, there's three important things you know. So every emotion, skill, feeling, thought is a precisely tuned electrical signal that's traveling through a chain of neurons, a circuit of nerve fibers, right? That's, that's skill in its rawest form. Myelin is the substance that wraps and insulates the nerve fiber and increases the signal speed, strength, and accuracy. So as, you know, let's say you're trying to learn something new on the drums and you're like, okay, here's this new thing. And you start into it and all of a sudden the brain's scrambling going, what the heck guys, we're supposed to learn this new thing. So what happens is there's supporter cells called, and I'm going to mispronounce this, but the, it's, it's ole, uh, oligodendrocytes, I believe is, is what it is, and astrocytes. So they sense the nerve firing and what they, this is getting way nerdier. Probably Nerd it up, right? yeah. uh, so they were, the nerves firing and they respond by wrapping more myelin uh, around the fiber that fires. So what it's doing is in turn, it's making this insulated high speed cable essentially is what it's doing. That's what my brain goes to is an audio cable where you have a, it's, it's got a bend, it's got a break. You start introducing noise into the cable mm -hmm. and you start, the, the cable's compromised. It's not a nice exactly. tight, well-made cable. Right. And it, it results in increasing velocities up to, which is the crazy thing, increasing velocities of speed as far as skill uh, uh, skill acquisition, skill development, skill uh, execution of up to a hundred times wow. an uninsulated nerve fiber. That's crazy that we can go a hundred times faster just by insulating that. So you've got that, uh, the, everything is, is, a, is, is traveling along a, a set of neurons. Myelin is the substance that wraps it. And the more we fire a particular circuit, the more myelin optimizes it. So the more times we're correctly repeating something and going through it, the more the brain's going, hey, those supporter cells are firing it, and they they that myelin starts to grow around that nerve fiber, and it starts to insulate it, hmm. so it can fire quicker. It can we can we can communicate, and we can improve the computer in our head. But they didn't know this 20, 30 years ago. Hmm. This is something yeah. that they didn't know. So skill acquisition has zero to do with talent. Skill acquisition is all about myelin firing the correct neurons and getting it to wrap around there, so that you can do that skill faster. You know, can I create more myelin or can I, am, am I stuck with what I've got or no, can no, no. I so the, enhance the, it or how's that work? Yeah. So the myelin grows as, you know, okay. as those, as it's triggered to grow. In other words, it's like, oh, we're doing this skill. Let's start insulating that. So it, it grows, you know, got within it. there. So you can, you know, where you weren't insulating something now you are. We have these great studies that have come about, you know, um, uh, there's a great book called Why We Sleep. And it's the importance of sleep for the brain and what it does to the brain, how the brain functions while we're sleeping. There's a reason why you can't play something one day, you go to sleep, you wake up the next day, you go sit down on the kit and you can all of a sudden play it. Isn't it like it's, it's like a dishwasher where it cleans? I forget what I was just listening to where you go to sleep at night and it runs like a dishwasher that cleans out all this gunk in your brain. Yeah. So what happens is our brain doesn't go to sleep. Our brain, different different areas of it start firing. And, and it's really it's really fascinating to watch the brain as we sleep. The brain's not sleeping. The brain is busy firing, trying to make sense of what was happening during the day, trying to get that myelin in place, trying to, so that the next time you sit down, it's able to perform the task that you are asking it to do. So the brain understands and it just needs time. That's why I tell all my students, I say, if you'll just give the brain time to do what the brain does best, it's really a fascinating thing. So instead of my, my practice time, I was just learning a David Garibaldi groove. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm teaching a lesson on him. Um, and lots of notes, right? And at first it's frustrating. But what I, what I tell myself is, no, you just need to repeat it successfully, slowly, over and over in small chunks. And if we do that and create those feedback loops, eventually you start catching on and it gets smoother and all of a sudden... Yeah you're able to play this thing. So just knowing how the brain functions helps me in my practice time go, you know what, I just, 
I have to give it physically more time for myelin to grow and insulate that fiber so it can fire faster so that I can play this thing that I want to play. Is that um, why sometimes if you play something and you struggle with it and you're like, I just can't get it and you come back a day later and you're like, wow, I got it now. One of the big things and, you know, us talking about the, the cognitive abilities or, or talking about, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex and task management and all that stuff, we, we didn't understand. Uh, and one of the things that the, stu the study I mentioned earlier, the, the role of deliberate practice in the acquisition of expert performance, um, one of the things they found out was that just as important as um, the practice time, even more so, is your time away from the instrument. So they found that, you know, these these P players who were top of the tops, elite in their field, were sleeping three and four times as much as they were practicing. Their recreational activity was two and three times the amount of time they spent practicing. On the weekends, their their recreational activity and sleep may fl may flip a little bit, but they're still maintaining these ratios. So what that tells us is, the amount of deliberate practice we're able to do on our instrument is not really related to how much time we have. Mm. And, and, and the elite in, field, in any field, how much time they spend practicing is not related to how much time they have to practice. What it's related to is how long it took them to recover from their last deliberate practice session. So what this does for us as drummers and what you know used to growing up when I didn't understand this, I would get very frustrated and I'd be like, I got eight hours, I'm just gonna muscle this out. Well, that's not really the best way to go about learning this instrument. You'll go through phases where you're practicing, you know, five, six, seven hours a day, but you can't sustain that long term. And so what is good to know is I put in my two hours. Now I'm gonna go, and it's great for me to understand that spending time with my wife is actually helping me get better at the drums. It's actually helping my brain recover. Sleeping is helping my brain recover. Eating is helping my brain recover. And that helps my next practice session. So yeah. knowing that takes a lot of stress off of our practice time as drummers. And there are times when I go, you know what? I'm done for today, I'm putting it down. Yeah. And, and then I just walk away and I'm cool with it, you know. Another thing we didn't understand that was that focus was a finite uh, focus. We don't have endless amounts of focus during the day. It is very much uh, like a mo muscle. It is limited. We only have a certain amount of it during the day. And so I actually organize my work day according to how much focus I feel like I have. And I, and I have a list of physical tasks I can do that take zero brain activity and a list of those more intense, I really need to think through these. Hmm. Um, so really these advancements in how the brain works give us a better view of how to learn an instrument. When did they come around? Like when did all of this stuff come into play? I mean, is this in the last 10 years? Is this... Uh... Uh, so, so the advancements in the brain and understanding of it really in the past 20 years, it's just been a slew of things. And you got to think, all the advancements that have come up to this time within drumming, within technology, um, now that we have better imaging, now that we can, like all those advancements in technology is what's allowing us to be able to see all these things that in flip help us to learn something like an instrument better. There's a great book called The First 20 Hours where he goes through kind of that initial learning phase of those first 20, 30 hours hmm. um, and how to do that. So um, cool. it's, it's really a crazy thing how the how the brain works. Now, another advancement with drumming that has allowed us to become more efficient with practicing. Is this kind of is this kind of going where you want it to? I just want to make sure. I'm, oh, no, no, no. I love this. I mean, I would just say my the takeaway that I'm getting for that as a, you know, it's it's modern stuff, but as a drummer would just be to to not drive yourself nuts feeling like you didn't practice for 8 hours. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's beneficial to let your brain rest and all that stuff, which and we can learn from the history of people not doing that, not knowing this. Exactly. And, you know, it's beneficial to have a balanced life. You know, it's not okay to burn yourself out just doing this one thing. Um, my marriage is happier when I practice and my practice is happier whenever I spend time on my marriage. Yeah. My practice time is better whenever I spend time with my kids. My practice time is better whenever I get enough sleep, whenever I'm going to movies with friends. It increases my practice time and the productivity in there. So knowing that allows me to actually schedule events for my practice, you know, no, I'm taking time off. I'm going to go for a walk. That's mm -hmm. going to help me be a better drummer. You know, yeah. uh, seems it seems counterintuitive, but that it, it really is that. So another one of the advancements that we've had is is advancements in um, how we're able to practice as far as the physical instrument. So uh, e kits coming around. So many for many years, drummers were not able to practice in apartments. That wasn't an issue for a guitar player. They could just kind of grab the acoustic and practice in an apartment. Whereas we as drummers, this no one wants to hear you play in an apartment. It's not pleasing at <laughs> no, all. No. 
And so when you have something like an e-kit come around and some of the more recent advancements we've started seeing like silent stroke heads from Remo, Aquarian's got their super pads that you can play on. Yep, we have Zildjian making things. Yes. Yeah, Zildjian making LED symbols. Um, many people who couldn't practice at one time now can, whether that be they couldn't practice because of their physical location. I've lived in apartments. I couldn't practice because of a town home. I drove across town to a, a practice unit that I rented um, to practice every morning at 5 a.m. Uh, I get it. Um, so, you know, that allows them to practice or whether that be because you have a family member that hates your drumming and that's totally cool. You know, that's an issue y'all should probably talk about, but um, <laughs> <laughs> probably should bring that to the table sometime. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you can practice quietly before. Oh, the only time I have to practice before work. Cool. Grab some LED symbols, some silent stroke heads. You're now able to practice before work. It's a crazy thing. So what I've seen as a teacher in the online uh, uh, space is I've seen a massive movement of 40, 45 and over coming to the instrument. Uh, they have the time, they have the money to grab the stuff. And now, oh, I can get this e-kit. Um, oh, I can get this, you know, silent strokes, or I have the option to do both, yeah. et cetera, and so forth. So um, advancements on, on the side of, of the instrument itself yeah. allows us to now practice um, an instrument that's abrasive and loud at times when before we were unable to practice. No, and I find it kind of interesting with that about um, like e-kits, been around for a long time. I'm going to say um, they're I feel like we can do a whole episode on e-kits and Simmons and the Lindrum oh, machine and all that sure. stuff. But, so I'm just going to throw this out there without knowing that I'm correct. But um, I feel like e-drums were originally created to be a part of someone else's, uh, to be a part of a bigger drum set. You know, the big mm -hmm. octagon pads, mm -hmm. like the Simmons. I forget what it is. It's the SDX or something yeah. like that. Um, that, to me, wasn't created from, from what I can put together to be in someone's apartment. You're not going to mm -hmm. have because I think they were super expensive, yeah. like a lot yeah. of, you know, V drums and stuff are now. But it went from being this kind of 80s flock of seagulls, kind of huge octopad set to a smaller, this is made for apartments kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that seems like more of a, a recent kind of, uh, you know, d going from these big electronic drum sets to, <clears> oh, wait, <throat> people want to do this to be quiet, not to be for you know, sure, for sure, 80s new wave band. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's amazing the number of advancements that have come along and that have affected our, our instrument as we go. Now we've talked about all the positive things. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be Debbie Downer. Let's get negative. apologies to anybody that's named Debbie out there. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be Debbie Downer here and be that, you know, I'm like that old guy railing against social media. I'm really not. I post there all the time. If you don't follow my YouTube channel, I post four lessons a month there. Some of them are 30, 45 minutes. Like, I'm all about it. But what has happened is we've had social media come along. So before, whenever I saw my favorite players play, so let's just take a Dave Weckl. I went and saw Dave Weckl play in clinic. I learned from his rock drumming play along book. I saw him play with Chick Corea uh, recently. Um, I mean, like, I love watching Dave Weckl play with music. Now, take social media nowadays and the 60 second glimpse we get of this person or the two or three minute curated view we get of this person. And you, you have the ability of separating the drums from the music. Mm -hmm. And what this has done is it's, it's, almost, it's almost given everyone a wrong and incorrect starting point. And if we start from the wrong point, if we start away from the music and we start from, I'm just learning this because that guy can do these licks. Um, this is where we start to have a disconnect from the music. And this is where you see a lot of older players kind of kicking back against social media. Now, this is not just me saying that. So I've talked to teachers from Berkeley. I've talked to teachers from different universities. I've talked to private teachers. We're, they're all saying the same thing. And that is, there's a disconnect between what this person knows and what is actually needed on the gig. Yeah. There's a disconnect between what the student can play. They can play this fantastical 30 second note, you know, linear whatever on the drums, but they can't keep a beat for two minutes. You know, they can't play, uh, you know, Billie Jean correctly. Yeah. So what that leads to in the practice room is a real discontentment with where you're headed. Because instead of the goal being to create music, the goal has now been to one up or to learn this crazy lick. And when you can't pull that off, or what I see a lot of times when you can pull it off, but you don't understand the musical application for it. To me, it's a very empty goal. To me, it's a very 
empty place to wind up at a place where I can play this crazy lick. But I have no example of it ever being used in music. Yeah. I have no way to ever know if it could be used in music. I just know this crazy lick. So for me, whenever we have a disconnect like that, that is brought about by technology, that historically they did not have to deal with, um, now we have a problem in the practice room. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, we can go as deep as you want. There's a great book called Deep Work, uh, another one called The Distracted Mind I mentioned earlier, where it goes really in depth on... Um, discussing the amount of the population now that is displaying signs of OCD. Um, so they are self-interrupting themselves. They are checking phones, tablets for the sake of checking them. And for all of you that want to test on this, the next time you're standing in line at your favorite coffee place, time how long it takes you before you interrupt yourself standing in line and say, I need to check whatever it may be. Yeah. Maybe it's your email, maybe it's your cell phone, maybe it's whatever, you know? Um, we're self-interrupting ourselves. Uh, the book Deep Work goes into how workers in modern day knowledge work, which is what many of us do, um, are losing the ability to go deep because they're always skating on the surface of checking email, checking social media. Let me you know, respond to this message from my coworker. Oh, they just interrupted me here. Open working spaces, blah, 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 blah. All of this bleeds over into the practice room. And I can give you a really good um, kind of We'll go back historically, you know, let's go back to when I was like 22, 23. So I played on Bourbon Street. I got, I began gigging when I was 16. I got my first full-time gig on Bourbon Street at John Wayner's famous store on the corner of Conti and Bourbon when I was 19. And I did that gig for three years and kind of had proved to myself I can make a living as a musician. This is a dead end road uh, as far as um, just staying on the street there on Bourbon Street. There were guys there that were 55 I was playing with that had coke habits. They, you know, I was go keeping their family while their wives were going to try to find them behind grocery stores all cracked down. Yeah, like, yeah. it's a real life experiences of, of you know, I had a, I had a um, one keyboard player that was on heroin and just could not shake it. Like, real life situations, alcoholics, all these things of a life lived on that street and not going any further. So I said, you know, I think I've learned what I can learn here. I want to go ahead and move on and go back and get my jazz studies degree. So that's what I did when I was about 22, 23. I quit the gig I had, uh, the full-time gig I had working six or seven days a week playing um, what I always thought I wanted to do. And I went back to school and paid to do that. And um, during that time was right around the time the cell phone was starting to come. And I resisted getting one for a long time because I saw it as a distraction. And then, you know, finally got one because I was missing work. Well, then texting came along, you know, and I remember distinctly the first time texting entered my practice space. So I'm sitting there practicing and my practice time was like my time. You know, yeah. was, you know I, my wife, uh, I actually met my, no, I didn't meet her. She saw me for the first time at my very first gig. Uh, I was playing percussion uh, in a Christmas show and I stood up and had to play Jingle Bells. You know, I was like the percussion guy yeah. and they had a Rudolph nose on me with antlers. And that's the first time my wife saw me and she's like, you know, sold whoever that man. guy. Yeah. yeah, gotta marry that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it went way different than that. But um, so I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, I found my career and my wife in the same night. So wow. um, and that was when I was 16. And so she's been with me this whole time. She understands that I have to practice all this stuff. So uh, that was kind of an understanding. I am practicing and um, I remember right before I sat down to practice, a text came through. Well, I had never received texts. I had not pre-programmed myself. I need to check that. I'm like, I'm sure it's not important. I just put the phone down, plugged it in, uh, started practicing. 30, 45 minutes later, I pick up the phone and I've got like 12 missed text messages. Um, you know, I've got like three or four missed phone calls and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? You know, is she okay? So I called her and I said, hey, is everything okay? And she said, yeah, why aren't you answering your phone? I said, well, I was, you know, I was practicing. I told you I was going to practice. She said, yeah, but I've been messaging you. I said, yeah, but I was, <laughs> it's not yeah. like computing with me. I was like, yeah, but I was practicing. I'm yeah. not sure if you heard me say that or yeah. not. But, and, uh, and she said, yeah, I just thought something was wrong because you weren't answering your text. And I remember hanging up the phone and sitting, I was living in my grandmother's old house. She had passed away and we were taking care of it when I was in college. And I remember thinking, this is a, this is a problem. Yes. This is a problem for this to be able to interrupt my day like this. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of people trying to practice the drums with, they don't have a solid plan because they're grabbing this YouTube video, they're working on this lick, whatever that is. The plan is not centered around music. So there's no real end goal of this is the reason we're learning this. Mm -hmm. You know, everything I learned coming up was for a gig. I started gigging at 16. Like everything I was learning was 
on the gig, like you've got to learn this for a gig. Yeah. Gene Krupa, sing, sing, sing. Henrik taught me that on the back, on a on an upside down cardboard box, because I had to learn it for a gig I was playing. Um, and so there's a disconnect between why we're learning what we're learning, and then inner uh, all of the interruptions that happen, whether that be email, social media, uh, all the self interrupting behavior, checking social media during our breaks, all of that stuff, and our focus is out the window. So this doesn't seem like a big deal to do with drums, but it actually has everything to do with drums. And one of the biggest things you could do during your drum practice time is to, A, inform everyone that you're practicing the drums, don't interrupt me, <laughs> and B, eliminate the distractions. Something that people don't understand, they think to get better at focus, you have to try to focus harder. When really, to get better at focus, we have to become better at ignoring outside inputs. And so to focus harder, I don't, I don't try to focus harder. To focus harder on our conversation right now, I'm ignoring anything I may have to do tonight. I'm ignoring anything I may have to do in five minutes because this is what's important to me right now. And so we have to become better at ignoring. I see it as, like with anything you do, like you can spend twice as much time doing it kind of half as focused or focus 100% and get it done in half yeah. the time. Yeah. Just focusing 100% versus just splitting your time and saying like, oh man, I've got to do this, i got to do this, i got to do this. It's just, just focus, do it, yep. get it over with, and yep. you'll just do it better. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll have people say, you know, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm just checking my email before we start this lesson. And I say, well, why would you do that? You know, well, I'm not going to respond. And yeah. so I'm going, why, why are you checking? Man, I'm <laughs> All so that's going to do that. is whether you respond or not, in your head, you're writing that email to your boss. In your head, you're aggravated about that customer that needs a refund. In your head, you need to give your friend that link that they wanted to buy the sweater that you got. In your head, you're already fulfilling it, so you might as well stop what you're doing and go do it. Yeah. Because in your head, it's gonna constantly remind you. It's kind of the lizard brain part of our, of our brain. Yeah, So, yeah. Um, uh, as well, uh, technology has brought a lot of positive things, but there's also a lot of of not so great things that it's brought with it in the in the form of distraction, um, which is what I spend a lot of my time dealing with, and it's and it's you know confounded because I teach online, yeah, and so I spend a lot of my time trying to limit how much my students interface with um, tablets and phones that are connected to the internet or anything or Wi-Fi, uh, you know, put it on airplane mode, tell people you know you're not there, you know, turn your email autoresponder on, whatever you have to do to let them know that you're busy. Um, and totally. for me, it's come down to getting very serious about things like email. I batch check email. I batch response to email. So two or three times a week, I reserve three and four hours and I go, I get a lot of email. Yep. So I go through it and I respond to everyone during that time. And so you're getting a response in about the same amount of time you would get from me, but it's not interrupting my Your entire time. day. Yeah. Man, another negative that I think of is you kind of talked about it earlier of like, could imagine seeing like... Tony Williams on um, Instagram or Gene Krupa. Now, I almost think that wouldn't be as cool. I think that sometimes when you can see everyone, you can be like, oh, this is this famous drummer's dog. It's like, mm -hmm. and here's him hanging out at the beach with his wife. It takes away a little bit of that kind of mystique and coolness. I, I think so too. Where, I think where so too. Legend, you, it's, it's hard to be quite as much of a, a legend when everyone can see what you're doing all the time. So I think the mm -hmm. social media aspect is like, you know, sometimes it's like like you meet your heroes and then you realize they're just people. Sometimes you can meet your hero by searching their name on Instagram and finding them um, yeah. if, they're, if they're living. Where I think there's, there's a little bit of that, like, you know, oh my God, it's the coolest guy in the world. Elvin Jones, what if he was on Instagram? It'd be, it'd be yeah. different. Be just and different. he probably wouldn't be as good at his craft if we're being honest here because he's spending time on Instagram. Exactly. You know, there's nothing that Instagram helps you do on the drums as far as in your practice time. Yeah. Another another discussion I've gotten in with people is um, kind of that behind the scenes, which you were just referring to, what we not, used to never see. Um, and that is, you know, I've had this discussion of uh, the gospel chop scene or whatever that is. Um, and so they see these drummers that are playing an Ariana Grande gig or something that have the ability to have these monster chops. And they think that's called for to get that level of a gig because there's three or four examples of players playing at a very high level that can shred like crazy. 
here's the deal that a lot of them don't understand. For every player you have that is, and please, mad respect, I love, I love all drummers and all players. I'm not talking bad about any one person yeah. or style. But I can point to, for every player you point out, I can give you five or six right off the top of my head that do not have the capability to play those insane chops, but they'll go into a session and they'll cut a number one record in no time. Like yeah. it's nobody's business. Yeah. So what we're seeing is we're seeing kind of the fantastic side of drumming, whereas the real working nuts and bolts drummers, you know, I talk to them a lot and they're like, I don't know why anyone would find what I do interesting on Instagram. You know, making a number one album is not exactly, you know, I played, you know, the money beat or I played goom back goom goom back goom goom back for three minutes. Yeah. Why would they want to see me do that? They don't quite comprehend. Now, obviously, that takes an, an intense level of focus and uh, precision to be able to play like that. But they just don't see it translating on. They say there's nothing fantastical about this. This is just our job. This is what we do. This is how I you know, make my living. There's always going to be buddy riches. There's always going to be... The um, showman. and the, the Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a place for that. Totally. But as far as just... Drummers in general, our job is time and interacting with the music and making music. And it's not so much worried about chops. So the negative side of this, all these advancements we've made is it, it's got that down kind of dark side where we lose focus. We don't have a plan. We're looking at the wrong end goal. And uh, so when we do learn these really hard things, there's, they're not very satisfying because they're... Yeah. You know, that the, being able to play complicated on things on the drums is, is not an end goal within itself. The music is that end goal. Yeah. And so when we take that end goal away, it, it really becomes an empty pursuit to, in, my, in my mind. Yeah, exactly. You see some of the guys who are iconic drummers where um, they like, um, they may be a huge drummer in, and played on huge albums, but they have, they don't do anything with social media and they've got 200 followers. And it's yeah. like, that doesn't mean, that doesn't take anything away from what they've done but then you look at someone who's just an instagram drummer which i mean obviously we are both guys who have instagram accounts sure. and focus on it and it's huge for our podcast and your business and everything but um that doesn't mean that it, it's just different to have a number one smash hit album playing drums on it you know what i mean it's just it's just an interesting well and it and it's the difference, you know, whenever, if, if you were to take Tony Williams away from the Miles Davis, you know, group or any other group that he played in, there was ton, tons of them, and isolate his drum tracks, they don't really make a lot of sense by themselves. Yeah, exactly. But once you put the music in there and then you hear what he was playing to and who he was responding to, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. So that lick really wasn't just a lick. He was responding to whatever, you know, they yeah. did. Or like Phil Rudd, in the moment. ACDC yeah. kind of thing. It's like, I mean, very appropriate drummers for who they're playing with sure sure it's all about what job are you doing and what's your goal for learning this instrument yeah so it we're, we live to we're in a very blessed time we have all of these resources you have the ability to take from you know people you would never be able to take from um take advantage of that but as as well just understand that they're just tools yeah you know and uh, not everything's a nail. You don't need a hammer for everything. Not everything's a screw. So you don't need a screwdriver for everything. You need different tools for different things. And when that tool has exhausted its use, put it down, you know, and, and go back to um, to doing things the way we've done them and learning the way we learn. Very well put. Um, so, Stephen, if people wanted to learn from you, because you are obviously, as they've learned, a very well-spoken and uh, thoughtful guy when it comes to drums, um, why don't you tell them a little bit about you or where they can find you and uh, what you do as we kind of wrap up here? Sure. So, um, I uh, grew up a pastor's kid in South Mississippi, and my parents both dabbled in music. My mom was the minister of music, and so I had kind of that early exposure to music and song and in that setting early on, uh, started playing when I was uh, 14 and played on stage my first time that first week I had my drum set. That's where that mentor I talked about earlier, yeah. he said, you know, your mom told me that you're a drummer. And I said, well, my mom's wrong. I have a drum set, <laughs> uh, definitely not a drummer. And he said, cool, I need you this weekend. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure you heard me, Joseph. It's uh, I, I have a drum set. He's like, yeah, don't worry. You're a drummer. Just watch <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, just watch my hands. So I played three times that week for three different groups of people and services. And wow. um, 
So all through my high school, I had two to three rehearsals a week, two to three shows, gigs a week within the church. And then I started gigging when I was 16 uh, with cover bands, stage shows. I did a ton of stage shows and pit drumming. Um, and then when I was 19, got my first full-time gig. Uh, did that in, Bur in New Orleans, then moved back, got my degree in jazz studies. Then we came up here to Nashville and I kind of started doing the Nashville thing and played with some, you know, some some major label artists and kind of proved to myself that I could do that. I was playing some sessions with players that I really respected and kind of proved to myself I could do that. I got signed to Universal Records with my own group and um, and proved to myself I could do that. I'm not really a competitive person when it comes with other people. I'm very self-competitive. But once I've kind of proved something to myself, I really have to step back and go, does this make sense for me and my family and how I want my life to look? And the yeah. touring musician life, it wasn't looking too appealing to me. Um, the studio work was drying up a lot of it. It's very, you know, uh, and so I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do and how to do it. So I got completely out of music for um, uh, a few years, took up personal training. And my wife said, are you ever going to get back in music? And I said, well, if I do, I'll be able to say where I work, how I work, who I work with, how much I get paid, all that stuff. And I told her, I said, maybe someone would want lessons online. I don't know. YouTube had just come around. Nobody had, there wasn't anything monetized. Um, I think Mike Johnston, this was his early days when he had just posted a couple lessons on YouTube. Nobody, it was just kind of a new thing. Yeah. And uh, I had just bought a computer and I told her, I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe that'll be something I can do. So anyway, fast forward, I started, you know, posting videos on YouTube and um, 2011, I opened up uh, my website, stevensdrumshed.com. And um, that was when I started taking online students. And I've been doing it full time since the middle of 2015. Um, now I have a couple of people that work with me and uh, we've just bought a place for the studio. We're, we're, we're renovating that right now. Really excited about that. We're gonna yeah. start offering some in-person drum camps. And uh, so we have a membership program on the website, the Drum Better Daily program. Um, and you can get in there, great community of drummers. We have uh, kind of what would, I guess would set me apart is I'm very focused on goal driven. Uh, success driven lesson so you get in there we get you a plan together and then you execute on that plan and you work through the lessons that you need to and ignore the rest and then we have live stream Q and A's and we have the forums and we have you know um, we have tech talk and we have all kinds of stuff in there that are resources but the core of it is we this is your plan this is what you're working on and then we have that ability for them to send in things to get reviewed and cool. email me and talk to me and chat so that's there if you want some free stuff we got the drum uh, the drum show podcast that's a newer thing. I yep. think we're uh, eight, nine, ten episodes in. And um, I've been answering emails since 2009. Um, and I started at some point answering with voice messages because uh, I get uh, so, many, so many emails. And I've answered the same questions over and over for the years. So I've developed a very thorough answer for, hey, what if I feel unbalanced on my drum throne? I actually have a very thorough answer for you on that. I have a very thorough answer for, um, you know, hey, what's going on with my hand technique? I have very thorough answers for, for some very common, you know, uh, my wife hates my drumming. What do I do? You know, that I actually have a thought out thorough answer for that. So um, that's the focus of the drum show is it's just a Q&A format. It's, it's drummers questions from around the world. I pull directly from them and then I answer them. It's all about uh, you guys. And so um, that format really excites me. And it's just, and it's, and it's, we're getting good feedback and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. It's so every, great. every, yeah. Every episode's about uh, three or four questions long, and um, we really get into the nitty gritty of drumming and our jobs as drummers. And you know, uh, my goal is that you take three or four things away from it every time you listen. Uh, huh? I didn't think of it that way. Or oh, I'll try that. Uh, that's the goal for that. YouTube, you can catch a free lesson weekly. Uh, Saturdays is whenever I drop those at the moment. And uh, so yeah, always tons of free stuff. There's you know some 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 paid stuff if you want that as well, but. Um, if, if you want to check me out and then I'm obviously on all the socials as well, Instagram yeah. and all that. I it's just, yeah, you're, you're a great guy and you're very, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, it gets you all jazzed up to, um, to practice when you hear someone else who's really passionate about it. So, um, I appreciate sure. you sharing your knowledge. And again, so everyone knows that's stevensdrumshed.com. Um, the drum show podcast which is awesome i'm a fan of it i listen to it regularly and hear other people's questions and, and i think it's cool because sometimes you um i like to think that maybe i do this with this podcast is sometimes people are afraid to ask questions because it looks makes you look dumb or it makes you look like yeah. you're not professional and um i try to do that on this show where i say man i don't know what that is i i don't know what the heck myelon is or <laughs> <laughs> myelin, <laughs> myelin. Um, exactly so uh now i know but um awesome yeah 
and thank you for you know this this i think is something that's needed in the drum in the drum space is that historical look at what we're doing and and why we do it i think we can learn so much by looking uh, at the past and looking at how people did it before and we really can't become a unique creative until we have emulated uh, the greats and emulated our, our our idols and heroes. And so I think something that supports the history of our instrument is is really important and really sorely needed yeah. in our in our niche. So I really appreciate you bringing that to the table, man. Cool. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to have you on the show, and um, I will uh, I will see you around. And and I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Tim from Queen City Drums, who is currently in Nashville, your neck of the woods. He's picking up a uh, drum set for me from uh, Maddie Meyer, who's a former guest. It's a little Gold Sparkle Apollo uh, MIJ stencil kit that I'm getting to put in my... uh, My wife said, why don't you get a little drum set so I have a three-month-old baby so the baby can grow up around drums. And I'm like, yeah, it's done. Done. I done. (laughs) Done. I already ordered it. it. I already bought it. So um, (laughs) again, thank you to Tim from Queen City Drums uh, made here in Cincinnati, Ohio. very cool guy and he really helped me out on that one so cool man well i'm excited to start using your uh your lessons i'm going to start with the saturday ones and uh and go from there on my new gold sparkle apollo drum set i know man i'm jealous thanks for having me bart i really do appreciate it see you steven if you like this podcast find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time keep on learning This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.